2016, Overwatch was seen as a potential new frontier for online multiplayer gaming, and ultimately, a potential new frontier for esports as well. Now, in 2023, the entire community seems to have turned against the developers, content creators, Overwatch League franchises, and each other. Where once the number one tip players would give to newer players starting out and trying to rank up in competitive would be to join team voice chat, these days I keep having one experience on console over and over again. Players in voice are more belligerent, players in text even more so. Where toxicity has always been a problem in the game, and for any online multiplayer game like this, half the time it feels like players speak in thought-terminating cliches and are devoid of self-awareness. The meta game is regularly so stale that the competitive ladder became a joke from the sequel's launch, and players who make this game a part of their livelihood frequently stick to game modes without that key competitive integrity. It seems like, for every success the game has had in cultivating a new player base and exploring new income revenues for Activision Blizzard, it also has encountered stumbling blocks in scope and number to the degree that this game's past potential as a masterpiece is severely in question. The marketplace and economy might not be a perfect measure for the merit of art, so in spite of the obvious success of Overwatch as a project, I'd like to take some time to talk about the ways the game has been severely challenged at multiple levels. If that seems like your thing, stick around, give a like, subscribe, comment with your thoughts, and share with your friends. Keep things civil, and I will endeavor to do the same. As I've already implied, Overwatch was among the most hype games to release. It came out the same year as Dark Souls 3, Battleborn, Battlefield 1, and Pokemon Go, all of which I tried out at one point or another. One of them even led me into one of my favorite gaming franchises of all time. Battlefield 1 was eventually left behind by many players for new shooter titles, Pokemon Go retained a following but lost its novelty to many, Battleborn cratered due to a combination of slow queue times and awkward content monetization while competing with Overwatch for public attention, Dark Souls 3 became another badge of honor for a rising darling of the gaming industry, and Overwatch retained its popularity through many trials and tribulations. And what a series of trials and tribulations they were. From when the first cinematics were released to the public, teasing the stories of a cast of diverse characters that would rapidly expand beyond their initial beta-tested boundaries, people could tell this game was something special. Those cinematics were getting tens of millions of views, with the Dragon cinematic of Hanzo and Genji continuing to push above and beyond 40 million views. People still talk about this cinematic to this day. All the Overwatch cinematics are the peak of game teasers, so when I tell you this game had potential and might still have it, all you have to do is go and watch Dragons or Honor and Glory to see what I'm talking about. And the thing is, it's not just that the game had potential at launch. Over the years, if you watched Overwatch from 2016 to 2023 and going into 2024 like me, you'll have experienced something similar with the balance of the game and how playing it actually felt. Sure, the days when your whole team could pick Winston in a regular quick play game, now called Unranked for you Overwatch 2 zoomers, or the days when you'd become a tanker support main purely because you got constantly queued into lobbies with 4 or 5 DPS players called Offense and Defense heroes back then for you boomers, or the days where you'd get easy team wipes just by popping an ultimate on even conceptually straightforward heroes might be long gone, but from those old days, both the community and the developers iterated into a shining new future, a future with possibilities. Was it always the most fun thing to get forced out of playing Death Ball because Dive was so dominant, or to get hooked playing around a corner by a Roadhog, or to get blitzed by a Beyblade before your Ana and Reaper could pop their ultimate abilities instead? No, but that's okay. The game was changing, even slowly. Of course, all of that was in the range of six to nine years ago. A few things happened with this game. First, the professional scene became a bit more codified by Blizzard as a company. The profile of things like the World Cup opened up the opportunity for new advancements like the Overwatch League. Unfortunately, the League was not to be, at least not yet. There were a couple problems with this move as a business venture. First off, esports has its own persistent subculture. Unlike with live sports that have stadiums built around physical play areas that need to be large in order to be navigated with physical activity in a dynamic fashion, any esports arena is comparatively intimate, with the players sharing a stage or stages with gaming rigs set up in more or less the same physical space. Not all esports occur live, but even when this happens, there isn't much of a need to have variety in arenas or to have teams travel. This is also the case because esports has been a carefully cultivated scene with dedicated followings, bringing people into close online community with each other. As such, 
The mainstays of esports tend to be associations or clubs or brands built around a business venture and shared community identity. Fnatic, Cloud9, or Team Liquid would be examples of these kinds of things. And when esports brands were being brought into Overwatch, many implicitly expected this kind of thing to happen here. They were wrong. Blizzard instead appeared to guide the Overwatch League into franchising opportunities, with different teams having their branding structured around home cities instead. This immediately became awkward, since entire teams would deploy rosters for games that included zero players from their supposed home city, and the new branding threw off established esports fans. Blizzard essentially fumbled their opportunity with the Owl from the get-go, with a branding decision that didn't fully connect with anyone. Of course, there's a little bit more to it than that. Blizzard, to the extent that as of the beginning of 2023 there was an active lawsuit against them, and many people read this as a response to insufficient opportunities for franchisees to make their investment back. Fantastic, you poured millions of dollars into an Overwatch team. Now what? What makes that a profitable business venture? The actual real extent to which Blizzard was in violation of any contractual obligation to opportunities for financial returns has baked into it an interesting question that I, for all I try to do when scripting YouTube videos, do not believe I am capable of answering. However, I can tell you what happened with the United States Department of Justice getting involved and taking Activision Blizzard to court over what has been termed the Overwatch League's competitive balance tax. According to reporting from The Verge, Blizzard imposed a sort of limit on the maximum players could get paid, which was theoretically justified as a way to even the playing field in terms of how a franchise could invest in a team. But which in practice, wouldn't you know it, kept wages down for players. Apparently, once the Department of Justice even started investigating Blizzard, they quit the practice immediately. But obviously the law doesn't work like that, so they ended up settling this lawsuit. Overall, for these reasons and more, the Overwatch League remains a troubled mark on the ascendancy of a popular and enduring gaming intellectual property. That's a more business-minded analysis, at least as close as you'll get from me, thinking in terms of wages, law, branding, and public relations. But it's worth taking that tact for a portion of this video, because the next question you're going to ask me is, how did we get here? The Overwatch League is apparently over, and all YouTubers seem to do is complain about the game, so what happened next? Wasn't this video supposed to be about the sequel? Maybe in another timeline that would be true, but unfortunately the sequel to Overwatch is Overwatch. I mean that literally. If we skip over the GOATS meta era, and don't worry, we'll get there, we can cast our glance forward just a hair to the Overwatch 2 announcement cinematic on November 1st in 2019. A lot of people have misremembered and weird ideas about when things really went wrong for this game, but for me, this is basically the earliest moment when things got problematic. After this announcement, there were still a few characters to be released until Echo came out in an update in 2020. Part of what made Overwatch so competitive is that the development team kept releasing these huge and amazing updates for the game totally for free, but after that one, it ground to a halt. This would become the era of the Double Shield meta, and while I've referenced the meta games of Overwatch a couple times now, I'd like to now explain what made these two eras so bad for the game. GOATS is commonly taken to stand for Go All Tanks and Supports, and essentially described a team composition of half beefy characters who controlled map space, and half supportive characters who sustained the team. GOATS mirror matches were grindfests. I actually used to get a kick out of explaining to people exactly where a fight in a GOATS mirror would turn, because you could see it in the decision-making process behind each play, and it tended to be the result of a flashy cascade of ultimates. The inciting incident for the creation of the GOATS meta was the introduction of the character Brigida, whose main contributions to a team were, at least at the time, stunning enemies, holding space within her melee range, and generating armor and healing for her teammates. Healing regenerated lost health and armor reduced incoming damage. Playing Brigida alongside three tanks and two supports, usually Lucio for additional group heals with speed boost to compensate for limited melee range, and Zenyatta for the utility of Discord Orb to increase damage dealt to enemies, made teams unkillable. And in fact, when there were many variants of GOATs, they all tended to follow that model in some loose way. All three of those supports also have ultimate abilities that could make teams very difficult to kill in a teamfight. So the gameplay loop of a GOATS mirror was really more that of a gameplay Mobius trip. On July 18th, 2019, Play Overwatch posted a developer update teasing their new 222 locked roller queue, and GOATS faded into memory. Over time, three distinct team cops emerged from this new era of Overwatch, sometimes called Dive, Rush, and Poke. When Sigma came out, poke comps finally had a second tank character that could deploy a barrier to block incoming damage while also using his other abilities and dealing damage. 
Sigma and Arisa together formed the bones of the Double Shield comp, which would remain problematic until Overwatch 2 released in the fall of 2022. Originally teased as an upgrade to Overwatch that would allow both Overwatch 1 and Overwatch 2 players to play multiplayer on the same servers, but which would launch with a special story mode for Overwatch 2 players, the development of Overwatch 2 was troubled. Initially, the game seemed to feature a robust system of on-the-fly upgrades, not too dissimilar from Battleborn's Helix system, where the DNA of a character could be leveled up and altered in a limited number of ways mid-game to achieve different interactions and effects. Because I was still mourning Overwatch's lost competitor, I thought this seemed like a great way to make PvE feel creative. Unfortunately, it was not to be. Realizing in 2022 that they had let their game languish without major updates, for two whole years, the Overwatch team unveiled a new version of Overwatch 2, with new priorities. This is about where some of you might have come into the picture. Overwatch would now be free to play in all multiplayer aspects, with players only needing to invest time and beat challenges to unlock competitive multiplayer and the full roster of heroes. PvE, we were told, would be scheduled for later seasons, and now the development team would have time for the PvP experience again, including a new battle pass system that, with some growing pains, has come to be begrudgingly accepted by the community. I hope all of this has seemed fair on my part, because I'm about to get into the real current problems with the game. That was just the catch-up. You now know about what kind of hero shooter multiplayer game Overwatch has been, as well as what the community has been through, more or less, but these are the design problems with Overwatch 2. As things stand, the developers have improved their response time to player feedback in terms of balancing and pushing for new additions to the game that resolve existing issues. New heroes are being planned and released along with new maps, game modes, and all sorts of crazy additions. When I started throwing this video together, one of the first things that came to mind was the competitive ladder. In Overwatch's competitive game mode, you theoretically have the opportunity to sweat against players who are maximizing their gameplay against you to prove how good they are at the game. Unfortunately, when Overwatch 2 launched, the developers decided to artificially deflate the ranks of players as well as overwrite their specific rank with a division title. Instead of being in, say, gold with 2,458 SR, you would now begin in bronze or silver with a simple number denoting your division, like bronze 2. However, since matches were made based on a hidden rating system, you were actually theoretically secretly a gold player being matched against other golds, not a gold player being matched with bronzes or a bronze with other bronzes. This meant that you had to beat players of your own rank enough times to rank up to your actual rank. Given that if you could beat players at your given rank that easily, you might not have been at that rank in the first place, this produced no small amount of frustration in players in the middle and lower ranks. Fast forwarding to today, with feedback including that of players like SK in her video about why Overwatch's competitive ladder feels so bad, the developers seem to be breaking new ground again by reworking how displayed ranks work and what players have to do to earn their rank every season. This change, or changes like it in the future, will hopefully contribute to an environment with fewer instances of things like rank camping, where a player would play a few games and then log off before earning any significant number of losses, thereby allowing them to sit at the same rank as players who struggled to keep their rank. Meanwhile, however, there are still threats to the competitive integrity of Overwatch. Off the top of my head, console players still have the very real problem of widespread Zim usage. A Zim adapter is used to connect a mouse and keyboard to the gaming console in a manner that causes the console to recognize the inputs as controller inputs. Because console Overwatch has not had native support for mouse and keyboard in the way that PC Overwatch technically supports controller usage, Zim users get the benefits of fine control that come with aiming with a mouse, plus all the benefits of aim assist as designed for console controller players. PC controller players don't even get aim assist, and doing this is against the rules. So all the players who do this are necessarily a bunch of cheating scrubs, but there are so many of them that you'll have zimmers somewhere between every game and every other game, often on characters that benefit from them like Widowmaker, Iliari, Soldier 76, or Tracer, but also on characters that you wouldn't think would benefit quite as much, like D.Va or Orisa. The cursor movement is markedly different, so you can often tell when spectating from their perspective when you're dealing with a Zim user, and this is a reportable infraction. But the report system has never fixed this problem on console, and I wouldn't expect it to start now. The developers need to think bigger when it comes to resolving this endemic cheating problem. Moving over to issues of hero balance, there are three classes of heroes to which I've already alluded. You've got your tank, your damage, and your support heroes. 
From the 222 team organization, where players could queue with other players and get organized into three pairs within each role, the games are now 122, which has changed the team balancing from 6v6 to 5v5. This worked to resolve the fundamental underlying problems with both the GOATS and Double Shield metas, although players often don't think about it in those terms. Teams can no longer prevent damage by cycling barriers, and they can no longer hide behind multiple large bodies with defensive abilities. Similarly, with fewer such heroes on one's own team, the utility of dumping heals into your own team is now more situational or even absent from some engagements. However, this change has opened up another problem. One tank player cannot police an entire enemy team or an entire objective 100% of the time all by themselves, so the game has been opened up to squishy heroes making plays usually by getting picks. Therefore, even in the competitive ladder, the game is more deathmatch adjacent than ever, and this isn't entirely a good thing. See Flats' video about Overwatch having too much damage. The question the development team needs to answer for each role is this. What is the purpose of this role? What defines it? What distinguishes it? They have answers for these things presumably, but I think it has become apparent that there's a lot of bleeding between roles. For tanks, I have a very simple question for the developers. What do you want the role of a tank to be? Are they a damage-heavy role that can trade with squishies and take space for their team that way? Or are they more oriented towards stuns and effects that can control the pace of the fight? The developers should strive for some consistency in their vision in this way. The tank role has the potential to feel a lack of balance the hardest, since the most meta tank, or 2 to 3 most viable tanks, will be the ones that the same player will be pressured into playing every game. Tanks, however, are not the most problematic role at the present, so let's move from most unproblematic all the way to most questionable. Before we get to the other end of that spectrum, let's talk damage heroes. One strong type of damage hero is the ranged hitscan hero. These types of heroes require distinct primary fires that allow them to operate at different ranges, have different falloff damage, varied kill times, and things of that nature. One problem character for this class is the medium range hitscan Cassidy. As a character, he's very popular and has a lot of personality, but his mobility and damage potential at certain ranges and on certain maps are eclipsed by heroes like Ash, Reaper, or Soldier 76. If you can play all of those heroes, there isn't often a good reason to play Cassidy. From a design perspective, this implies Cassidy needs his own niche if we aren't going to rework those other heroes. If you're familiar with the history of Cassidy's ability, the grenade that does a different thing every few seasons, you might have questions. Didn't the developers strongly imply stuns and other similar kinds of abilities were leaving this game or at least being marginalized to certain roles? That certainly seems to be the case. I don't have any answers for these questions, but the goal here is to locate what the problems are, and with the hero design, it often comes back to hero identity. What is Cassidy for? That's the kind of question the developers need to answer so that they can then work on making him good at that. They seem to be making progress if you take the longest possible view, and as a Cassidy player, I appreciate it. On the other hand, damage heroes like Mei or Farah or Genji have the potential to be problematic, and I don't think buffs or nerfs are necessarily the answer. A gigabuffed Genji or a gigabuffed Mei are already the kinds of things players know are horrendous to play into, and every time these heroes get stealth buffed, my cursor hovers over the uninstall button. But with that said, these heroes do typically have a strong sense of identity. We can learn from this that hero identity does not necessarily resolve hero balance. Some heroes with decently strong hero identities were gigabuffed during the GOATS meta, and it took some time for the developers to key into the fact that these would inevitably be problematic down the line, especially in the case of tank busters given that there is now a single tank. So, role identity and hero identity are important. Next, the developers need to identify and execute on what I'll call identity limitations. This also seems to be something that they have a grasp on, so I'm preaching to the choir if any of them see this, but a good example of an identity limitation would be Overwatch 2 at launch, with how strong Genji felt into support backlines. A flanking Genji was, due to the different role passive and his state at the time, hugely impactful, and it often felt like where at the end of Overwatch 1, a Brigida and Zenyatta could slap around a flanking Genji, all of a sudden a Genji could farm them. Since Zenyatta's glass cannon support identity ends where Genji's mobile flanking style begins, and Genji's identity ends where Brigida's backline bodyguard identity begins, this is a conundrum. Theoretically, Brigida makes that situation untenable for the Genji, 
and at times when that isn't the case, that kind of lapse will be what should indicate to the developers that a rebalance or rework is imminent. To be clear, I'm not saying this because I don't like Genji players, but rather because I wanted to think of an example of how hero interactions going awry can signal balance problems. Finally, the most problematic role, the supports. Support players have admittedly been through a lot in Overwatch's history, and I want to be sensitive to that, but this role has gotten out of control. You might have seen this coming based on how this portion of the video has been oriented, but frankly, I don't know how anyone can think of this any other way. Support role identity has become problematic to the degree that there are whole support heroes in this, the Year of Our Lord 2023, that appear to be built around incentivizing getting picks. It was one thing when Zenyatta was a vulnerable glass cannon that could win duels while influencing teamfights, but now it seems like every new support has to be a DPS Part 2. It used to be that supports help teams win fights primarily by indirectly influencing outcomes and enabling other heroes. With this in mind, I have identified three categories that I call does too much, does too little, and unbalances the game. Heroes like Baptiste and Kiriko should not have that much damage and healing and survivability from their utility. They do too much. Moira inevitably needs some other kind of utility, and Iliari is very powerful, but is also a glorified damage hero designed to get picks with healing potential seemingly tacked on. They do too little, at least in terms of being an actual supportive hero. Zenyatta and Mercy require, in their in-game damage-altering abilities, some kind of counterplay beyond killing them, preferably from other different supports. The unique nature of their debuff and buff abilities, at least without considering the ultimates of heroes like Baptiste and Ana, mean that in some specific metas, if they aren't nerfed into the ground, they'll be too dominant. They break the game. And at the end of the day, some of this could be okay if the developers only had a solid plan for what supports are even supposed to be for. However, it seems like the role has expanded to include the design philosophy of the damage category, being oriented around getting picks. It's not that all of these things have to be totally reworked, but rather that from a design perspective, eventually something has got to give. I'd like to say a brief word in defense of Mercy players. Yes, it's annoying seeing people get carried to Masters or higher because they always queue with and pocket their one friend, but the truth is that Mercy is a character at war with her own design. Good Mercy players often talk about how important prioritizing Mercy's damage boost beam is, and they're right but that's also part of what makes her problematic. Simultaneously, I've had a go before at Mercy's who only hold Yellow Beam on their tank and talk about how big their healing stat is. The thing is, those people are wrong, but the developers were wrong first. Mercy is a doctor, a medic, a lifesaver, a healer. It's her whole character identity. If her playstyle is damage boosting and not healing, that's ludonarrative dissonance, at least as much as is possible in terms of character design in a multiplayer setting. Players who call for a mercy when they want healing are dumb because they don't understand how the game works, but the character design of the game is what implied to them that such an assessment would be accurate to begin with. This is something the developers should take to heart when designing and redesigning heroes. If you thought I was a little hypercritical in the previous section, or if you thought I was too forgiving in the first, this is the part where I hope to catch you off guard. I'm going to do the thing that frankly nobody who clicks on yet another Overwatch bad style video expects. You might think that I'm going to complain about the way the new PvE storyline was rolled out, and obviously I do feel immensely disappointed by the fact that the original content isn't going to be delivered with all of its features, at least as far as I can see. But there's a lot more to this than that. I'll start by acknowledging that yes, players were kept in the dark about what was going on behind the scenes and why for quite some time, and yes, Promises were not kept. But actually, as disappointed as I was, I do think there's more to criticize beyond that, and other people have done that already. No, I'm going to dress down the story behind Overwatch. This is the one thing that everybody always says the development team does right. This is the one thing that everybody always talks about as having real potential. But why? Overwatch has always been character-driven, but as much as the cinematics make for compelling short films, they're always just pointing forward gesturing vaguely towards something big, someday, somewhere. Something big is going to go down. And it's been nine years. Nothing big is going down. I'm here to rip that band-aid right off. I can't see anything compelling over that horizon story-wise, and I don't get what everybody else is seeing. 
Overwatch doesn't do large-scale stories well at all. In fact, it's a running joke that the writers behind this game have a hard time keeping their timeline straight. And that's been the case since people were making Bibles out of Michael Chu's tweets. I've been around. I've been looking at this game since the first cinematics dropped. I've been playing it since the year it launched. The story just isn't there. Characterization and world building don't make a story. They're good for science fiction and fantasy, and geeks eat them up. But I'm here to tell you that it takes more than that. The real potential of Overwatch's story was always beyond, and it looks like even if we do get there, it might not be anything remarkable or worthwhile. For a little bit of backstory, going over some absolute basics for anyone who wants to try the PvE content, the story of Overwatch begins with a global crisis where intelligent machines rise up against humanity a la Skynet and the Terminators. However, a global defense agency takes the reins and uses various super soldiers to stop the threat. This agency continues to operate outside the bounds of the law until it is shut down. Subsequent antagonists known as Talon and Null Sector emerge. Talon is a series of defector super soldiers, scientists, and wealthy benefactors. Their motto appears to be that humanity evolves through conflict, which is given to explain why they do the dastardly things that they do. In general, they are a series of grim, manipulative, mustache-twirling villains with little obvious motivation and a poorly defined ideology. They assassinated Mundata, a peaceful activist figure who was an advocate for humans and Omnics. They are represented by playable characters such as Widowmaker, Sombra, Sigma, Doomfist, and Reaper. By contrast, Null Sector is an extremist sect of Omnix that utilizes a robot army to inflict terror and destruction, seemingly at random in densely populated human settlements. The newer PvE game modes appear to hint that Null Sector is attempting to brainwash other Omnix, or the robot people who are more human than you might think, to some mysterious end. Their leader, Ramatra, is a formerly peaceful monk who turned into a violent revolutionary upon witnessing human brutality against Omnix. His goals are vague, and it is unknown if he knows Talon killed Mundata. Overwatch is recalled by Winston, and a few specific heroes answer the call over the course of the beginning of the modern PvE release, with older characters making appearances alongside more high-profile or newer characters. The future of Overwatch, in terms of the story of the organization, remains in flux. Now, what I'm going to say might strike some as overly harsh, but this story is somewhere between offensively bland and ideologically sinister. I know, trust me to always see the politically weird in the practically innocent, I get it, but hear me out. The Overwatch organization is essentially Batman's worst nightmare. It's Team America World Police, only with super soldiers and a diverse cast. Does that make the idea of the super CIA less sinister? When heroes load into the Watchpoint Gibraltar map, some of them will say, Overwatch was shut down for a reason, maybe it's better it stays that way, or if some other is such similar. Sojourn seems to echo this in the new story content. And yeah, I don't know if a post-Omnic Crisis Earth has some kind of ICC convention to deal with this kind of thing, and I don't know if it's possible to execute Reaper, real name Gabriel Rays, but man, this is not a good thing. What gets me about it, even in that case, is that it's possible for a story about this to be a good story. I mean, you can play as a clandestine super soldier in Halo Reach, and you can play as some pretty bad people up to and including Handsome Jack's personal bodyguard, his girlfriend, and his body double in Borderlands the pre-sequel, but those games embrace those elements of their characters and their identities. They don't jump straight to the uplifting message of hope in the face of difficult odds, they draw you in with compelling story situations and satisfyingly varied gameplay loops. The Overwatch 2 PvE campaign missions have very little of that. The heroes you play as are also the same old heroes that you may have hundreds or thousands of hours on already. Even critical gameplay moments where you have to destroy something in the environment don't really mix things up to the degree where it makes the other elements replayable. If the players were given this six or seven years ago, they'd be blown away, but this isn't what we've been waiting for. I think it should have stayed in the drafts. I know that sounds crazy, but I don't want any PvE content, I want good content. And if Overwatch only gives me PvP content going forward, if it's good, I honestly won't lose any sleep over it. I loved Junkenstein's Revenge and some of the Archive's game modes, but with time, I think I've gotten a pretty good picture of what the writing for this game is like. 
It's always the same couple of story beats about how the formerly enslaved, by the way, Omnix of Null Sector are reacting to their oppression wrong, as delivered in voice lines by your friendly neighborhood three-letter agency superhero, and how hope is important and people need heroes, but honestly, this story has enough heroes, it needs more real conflict. Let's talk about Null Sector. I won't hammer on the points about Talon any more than I already have. They're an eclectic evil league of evil that can't be more interesting than its most interesting members. Null Sector, though, they interest me. If you've seen my Bioshock Infinite video, you may recall how I was sympathetic to the idea of portraying a group like the Vox Populi as potentially being revolutionaries who also perpetrate injustices. I think there should theoretically be room for that in narratives about revolution and radicalism. Ramatra and Null Sector have elements like that in their characterization, but this game pulls its punches so hard. When Booker DeWitt shoots a member of the Vox Populi to death, he might think he's in the right, but the player doesn't have to be so certain. But Overwatch has yet to introduce any of that kind of moral uncertainty. Null Sector seems to be pretty bad for everyone thus far, regardless of Ramatra's intentions. But even the player is more or less free of any moral baggage that comes with fighting them, because it's specified that Null Sector sends in robots not Omnix. And you might be asking yourself, what's the difference? I thought the Omnix were the robots who essentially had a human kind of self-awareness, or intelligence, or a soul. Well, that's basically the case, at least as far as we know. But there's also non-human robots, which means every time the writers want the heroes to have a cheap heroic moment with zero ethical blowback, they have them kill robots instead of Omnix. This is the White Fang from Ruby problem all over again, if you've already got a generic antagonist, you don't need another generic antagonist. The only reason to introduce a secondary one is to carve out some kind of special moral situation like this. The developers seem to want to avoid giving players the impression that when they hear the pathetic crunch of a slicer beneath Reinhardt's hammer and see its broken little body, it must necessarily not have felt any pain or had any greater dreams or aspirations. It couldn't have been fighting for its people. It couldn't have been making the ultimate sacrifice. You can't possibly be the bad guy. It's just a hunk of junk. It's just a bucket of bolts. In a weird twist of fate, that line from the hero cinematic featuring Soldier 76 saving that little girl has become an indictment of this game's story. The writers are practically telling you, no, really, sometimes what these guys did to that poor Omnic in the street is okay, because unlike that particular Omnic, these other robots seemingly arbitrarily don't have feelings or souls. What makes it worse is that it's extra arbitrary given that other game modes have historically had us fight Talon soldiers. When I electrocute a man to death with Winston's Tesla coil, which seems like a horrible way to die by the way, Am I supposed to treat that the same as killing a Null Sector robot worse? Better? I mean, maybe he was just a mercenary killing for money and not fighting for a cause, and I don't want to get into whether video games can meaningfully trivialize human life, but it seems morally cowardly to not make the robots we kill all real people. Ultimately, I think that the writers on the development team need to learn to let their characters be morally complicated more often, especially in key story situations and not just in flashbacks. Everybody loves Hanzo, and everybody remembers when Genji told him the world was changing and it was time to pick a side. But we also get to play as Ramatra. If you want us to believe anything about him makes sense, if you want us to believe there's more than one side to this conflict that makes sense to the people who live in this world, if you want us to believe that these are real people, to actualize on all the characterization that you've been working with for almost a decade, then you have to dig deeper, I think. I'm not some legendary writer or critic who can tell you exactly how and why, but I believe it can be done. I believe all of those questions have answers and all of those problems have solutions, which is why I made this video. This game really could have been something, and it's strange and sad that it has this element to its potential that seems like it's always going to be out of reach. As frustrating as the game can be sometimes, there's something great underneath the surface, and I'm always saddened when a game that I have a lot of faith in falters like this. But it stops being faltering when it's a constant resting state, and it starts being the way things are. I don't want this to be the way things are, and I know a lot of people feel the same. If you would like to share your thoughts, please do so in the comments, like and subscribe for more, and I'll see you all in the next one.